And I, I really like coming here to talk to this group because it's a pretty intimate group. And really what I'm looking for is I'm looking for some feedback on a brand new talk. Uh, a lot of the words that are going to come out of my mouth in the next hour or so are things that have never been spoken. So I don't know what's going to materialize as a result of me giving this talk. Uh, it's the third time I'm presenting here. The first time I think I did the beer game talk, which I've been doing for seven years and started the Agile conference in 2009 and just been all over the place doing that talk. So I got it down pretty good. By the way, the last time I did the beer game talk was a month ago in Portland, Maine at a beer festival. <laughs> so um, there is no beer in the beer game, and it's not even a game, but it's a way that I come up with titles to lure people in to listen to what it is that I have to say. Because if I told you what the beer game is really all about, you would probably not want to attend. And the same applies here. So I call this the prisoner's dilemma. We will talk about you know that riddle that we've got, that paradox called the, the prisoner's dilemma. Um, but the real intent that I have for this, I'm going to hold off until the end because I need your feedback when we get to the end of, am I hitting the mark of what it is that I'm trying to get across? And I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that or not. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it to about an hour or so. Is that what the expectation is, guys? About an hour or so? So, Rajiv, I need you to help to keep an eye on the clock to make sure that the last time I did a talk, for the first time, it was my talk on servant leadership, which I'm not sure I did that one here, accountability and servant leadership. And I thought I was like 45 minutes into it, and an hour and 45 minutes later, I said, okay, now it's time for our exercise. And I had no <laughs> idea that I was talking that long. Uh, so th the first time is kind of be, it's going to be a little rough, and I'm going to get about two-thirds of the way through, and we're going to pause and say, okay, now where do you want to go with it? So I need your input, too to help me craft this into either a presentation that's worthy of me continuing to do over and over again, or you can just say, you know what, stick with the beer game or the Iron <laughs> Chef experience or something else. So um, there's, there's so many great parallels between the name Prisoner's Dilemma and cubicles, because it kind of looks like, you know, prison, the, the old cubicle farms that we've got here. So you can use your own imagination on drawing the parallel between the Prisoner's Dilemma here, but let me tell you how this talk kind of materialized. Let me tell you the story behind the talk. Um, my, my wife and I, our kids just left home for the, f they moved out within two weeks of each other. 21 year old son, 18 year old daughter. We live in suburbia. My daughter has gone to New York City. She's living in New York City, right across from Washington Square Park, if you've ever been. I mean, she's right smack in the middle of the ultimate in city life. My son, he's gone up to South Lake Tahoe, he joined California Conservation Corps, and he's going to be a mountain man. So our kids just went off in completely different directions from where we kind of raised them, and we're thinking, did we do a great job or did we do a terrible job <laughs> in raising our kids? So they left, and we said, let's go on a week's vacation to Hawaii. And so I'm sitting on the plane, going to Hawaii. I don't know how to talk to my wife anymore. We've got no kids, so what are we going to talk about? So I said, what's on the movies on, on the plane? And the movie A Beautiful Mind was on. And so I thought, I'll watch A Beautiful Mind and see, you know. Had you seen it before? I had never seen it before. And everybody keeps saying how great it is, and so I thought I'd watch it. And so I'm watching the movie, and then how many of you have seen A Beautiful Mind? So nobody hasn't seen it. Okay, do you remember the scene where they're sitting in the bar, and the four beautiful women show up, one blonde and four brunettes, and they all start scheming on how they were going to get a date with the blonde. And this is where, you know, she's the blonde that everybody wanted to get. She's the prize for, uh, uh, and then John Nash has this epiphany. And the epiphany it ended up being something called the Nash Equilibrium. But I'm, I'm watching the movie and I hear words like system optimization. And you know what that does to me, you guys that know me know that it's like, I love this systems thinking stuff and the Nash equilibrium and what does it mean? And I said, there's something here that I have to understand because I'm sure it relates to what it is that we do in software development. I have no idea what it is. So, you know, I watched the movie. I didn't like the movie, by the way. I don't know if that's a bad thing or not. Uh, to me, this is like uh, the English patient in Elaine from, Fr uh, from uh, Seinfeld, if you've seen that episode, where I guess you guys haven't seen that episode. 
Mr. G, you don't watch Seinfeld, do you? So you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. So I, I didn't care for the movie, but this idea stuck in my head. And this is the quote that he says during his epiphany when they're sitting around there. He says, Adam Smith, who's the economist from, I don't know, 150, 200 years ago, he said, the best result comes from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself, right? But Adam Smith was wrong. Sometimes it's better to cooperate. Man, those words just stuck in my head. Cooperate and do what's best for themselves. To me, this is like local optimization versus global optimization and cooperation and, and so on. So I, I spent the rest of the vacation just thinking about this and trying to understand it and did some Google searches and, and, and came up with, uh, well, this, this is the official definition of the Nash Equilibrium that comes out of here. And I don't want you to read it. Don't understand it. I put it in here in case you want to get a copy of the deck and you want to read what the Nash Equilibrium is. So don't worry about it. But we are going to, we're going to allude to it. And we're going to allude to it in the context of trying to understand the answer to this question. Why? Why do we keep breaking Brooke's Law? Brooke's Law says adding manpower to a light software project makes it later. We know this. Don't we all know this? We've known this for years and years, but we keep doing it over and over again. How can we stop doing this? And so I've been looking for a way to be able to articulate to management a way to be able to convince them intellectually that you should not add people to a late project and how can I convince them of that? And that's what this talk is really trying to do, is it's trying to fill that gap between, I used to do this, I, I was a project manager. I've been in, in software for 26 years and 13 years in Waterfall and 13 years in Agile. I, I made this mistake over and over again. And I couldn't keep myself from making this mistake. So how can I stop myself from doing it? So I have this notion that if I can intellectually convince myself that I should not do it through analogies, through stories, through understanding of principles like lean and agile and the Nash equilibrium, maybe that will help me keep from making this mistake over and over again. So that's kind of what my intent is, is to be able to provide a way to convince management not to make these kinds of mistakes. So let's play along a little bit. Let's play the prisoner's dilemma. Are you familiar with what the prisoner's dilemma is? We're going to dive into it. Um, and, and, and I need a volunteer from the audience. Gee, Tom, I'll volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> this was not set up. <laughs> so, 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 Don, have we ever met before? Uh, no. No, we You're don't fine, know right? each other? Here, would you like a name tag? I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. I, well, Don and I work together along with Rajiv, we're all at GE Digital. Uh, but Don doesn't know what it is I'm going to put him up to, but I just said, Don, play along. That's all I've asked him to do. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe the prisoner's dilemma, okay. and then I'm going to walk you through it. And don't overthink it. Okay. I couldn't ask Rajiv to play this part because he will overthink it. Okay. You <laughs> won't overthink it. So just kind of play along. So here's... I like that or not. That was an interesting statement there. Is that sort of a backhanded compliment? No, not, not, not it's, involved, I think. It's, it's a great compliment, Don. You're I'll a man it. of the earth. You're, okay. uh, you're a rock solid guy. So okay. here's... Here's the deal. Let's just imagine that you and I are both prisoners. We've already been convicted of independent crimes, and we're both serving two years. So you're serving two years, I'm serving two years. Okay? Everybody good with that so far? The DA has a hunch that you and I were part of a bigger crime. He's got no evidence. But what he wants to do is he wants you or me to rat out the other person. So he makes us a deal. So he wants me to confess and to drag you down, but he's also going to ask you to confess and drag me down. Now, what's the incentive for you doing that? So here's what the, the rules are. If you confess, your two-year sentence is going to get reduced to one year. If you deny it, and I confess, I get one year, you get ten. Now, what they're doing is they're deliberately keeping us apart. They don't know what decision you're going to make. I don't know what decision you're going to make. So you don't know what know, decision. We both know all the rules. Both of us yeah. know the rules. And so you either can confess or deny. And you have to speculate what I'm going to do. Am I going to confess or deny? And your decision of what you're going to do is somewhat dependent on anticipating what my responses are going to be. Mm -hmm. Now, if we both confess, we get three years. Okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to think 
what is the most appropriate thing for you to do? Should you deny or should you confess? Now, don't answer the question yet. Let's walk our way through this. Let's just assume that I confess. If I confess, what should you do? I need to confess. And why? Because I'll, otherwise I'll get 10 years. You're going to get 10 years? Yeah. Or you're going to get three years? Well, yeah, I get a choice of 10 or three. But yeah. What if, what if, so if I confess, mm -hmm. you're going to want to confess. That's right. What if I deny? What would you want to do? I'd want to, I'd want to deny. Why would you want to deny? Because I want three years. Okay, but what happens oh, no, if... No, no, I'm sorry. If I confess, I get one year. You're right, right, right. Yeah. I want to confess. <clears throat> okay, so, so this is the I prisoner's... <laughs> yeah, that, that's all the rules. Yeah. So here is the dilemma. The best thing for you to do based on what the options are for me and you responding to what I do is to confess. That's right. So you're going to get three years. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get two years. You're not going to get one year. Because if we both decide that same thing, then we'll end up with three years, right? Yeah. So in all likelihood, the right. decision process that you're going through is the exact same decision process that I'm going to go through. Right. So regardless of how I choose, it's always going to be best for you to confess. Mm -hmm. It's always going to be best for me to confess. Where we're going to end up is we're going to end up in a place where we're both confessing. So this is kind of what it looks like. This is the prisoner's dilemma. Mm -hmm. Prisoner one, prisoner two. If, um, if prisoner two, which is in blue, decides that he's going to deny and you're going to deny, we're both going to get two years. What's the likelihood that we're both going to deny? Probably not. Um, likewise here, if I confess and you deny, you're going to get 10 years. If you confess and I deny, I'm going to get 10 years. And if we both confess, we're going to get three years. Mm -hmm. So the dilemma here is you're hosed. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be spending more time than what you originally had just because somebody came up with this idea that the two of us may be in cahoots and we're likely we may be or we may not be. But just the fact that you have been presented with this offer, you're going to spend another year in jail in all, in all likelihood. Or maybe one year, maybe 10, but you can't guarantee what it is going to be. So your best decision is going to be that. All right. The abstaining. Well, the abstaining is denying. Yeah, you're already serving two years. You're just going to say, no, I'm not going to do it. But if I deny, what's he going to do? He's going to confess, and he's going to get one year, and I'm going to get 10. Well, if I know that he's going to, if he's going to do it, then but, I'm going to also but, confess. But we don't know what the other one's doing. Yeah. What, what's, what but we need? I, I think in the game, you don't get to pick whether or not you answer the question. You, you have to answer the question one way or the other, in a sense, right? <clears throat> so, so this is what we've done. We walked through this. What should you do based on uh, what the other prisoner's choice could be? So if the other prisoner denies, should you deny or confess? If the other prisoner denies, I should confess. No matter what. If the other prisoner confesses, what should you do? Should you should confess. So in either case, we find that it's best for you to confess. So you should confess. So very good. So the Nash equilibrium is what it is that he was talking about. In systems, you need to be mindful of the behavior of systems. And if you have a system that's like this, like the one that we're looking at here, this is a non-cooperative system. I think it's important to recognize that, that Don and I are not cooperating. They're definitely keeping us apart. And there's, there's nothing, there's no bond between Don and I. It's not like we're brothers or something that I know Don's going to deny this and we're going to stick in this together. He's just some guy that I did a crime with, and so I can't count on him. So it's a non-cooperative kind of an environment. So we find that the best thing to do is for you to confess, and this is referred to as the Nash Equilibrium. So... Notice what happens here. No matter what I should be doing as prisoner to, I should confess. So everything is pushing me upwards. And for Don, everything for Don is pushing him in the other direction. And where do we end up? We end up in this state here in the top left-hand corner. And that state is known as the Nash Equilibrium. That is the state where the system will go to, and it is a stable state. There's no reason why Don or I would ever want to leave that state. Imagine, Don, that we both end up in this state. What's your only option at this point? We both confessed. What's your option? Can you do something different? Well, you can make a different choice. What would your yeah. choice be? Well, if I knew that you confessed, I would deny. No, no I would but, not. But you don't know that. But I don't know that. Yeah, yeah. So you and I are both serving three years because we both confessed. But what if you deny? What's going to happen to you if you deny? I'll end up with one year. 
you're going to get 10 years, I'm going to get one. Yeah. What happens if I deny? I'm going to get 10 years yeah. and you're going to get one. So there's, there's no incentive for us to move out of the state. And that's why it's called the Nash Equilibrium State. So these kinds of systems, these non-cooperative systems, tend to migrate up into this kind of a position and they remain there. That's why it's called a stable state or a Nash Equilibrium State. All right, any questions about that so far? How am I doing on time, Rajiv? Given that simple system, you constrain the system so much, is your example. Yeah. And that's one of the rules of the Nash equilibrium is the system is kind of constrained that you can I'm make. Constrained here, given yeah. That, but there's there's lots of factors involved other than just in, 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 in the New York prison issue. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <coughs> is this for okay for? <coughs> yeah. So we're we're making a point here that in a non-cooperative system, and when when you look at let's let's go ahead and use the term global optimization. What is the globally optimal thing for us to do? The globally optimal thing is for Don and I to serve the least amount of time possible. What is the least amount of time possible in this scenario? Both to deny and we serve two years each, four years. But what do we end up with? Because of this Nash equilibrium, because of a non-cooperative environment, we both end up serving three years, so the grand total is six. So we are driven away from global optimization. Is my time up already? Yeah, you, got, you got 30 Ten minutes. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> He's got more for a 45 minutes long. Oh. <laughs> 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 one way he's a guy who does one hour 45 minutes. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I blew your game up. I'm being a project manager. Yeah, okay. I'm batting. Yeah. I'm 30 minutes left for a 45 minutes long. Tara, this is what I have to put up with every day at work. <laughs> okay, calm. Yeah. Back, on track. You're, Back on track. You're, running you're like time. in a dilemma here, you know? You're yep. driven to the bad spot. You're not cooperating at all. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> that's why I like coming here. This is such a good audience. Okay, so it's a non-cooperative system. This is what we need to do is we need to start thinking of these things as systems and identify the characteristics of the system, just like you're doing, Stephen. You, you saw that this is a highly constrained system, and some of the systems that we work in at work do have some constraints. They're not as highly constrained as this, and we want to take an examination of those kinds of systems, and that's what we're going to be doing here in a little bit. We're going to loosen up the rules a little bit, but we're going to look at how this relates to what we do in software. So let's just keep moving along. Um, how many of you are familiar with this guy, W. Edwards Deming? Oh. He's a saint. Man, this guy's in the pantheon. Mm. Um, he wrote a book called Out of the Crisis, and it's one of the worst written books I've <laughs> ever read. It's, it's stream of consciousness. You can't tell when he's being sarcastic and snippy or when he's pontificating some great truth from upon high, so it's really hard to choke through. But he has some incredible insights, and his 14 points and his system of profound knowledge are absolutely brilliant. Has anybody read the 14 points of the system of profound knowledge? It's, it, sound, it, it's, it sounds kind of ominous, <laughs> profound knowledge. And the first time I read it, it's like most of them made sense, and there was one of them on there that made absolutely no sense. He said, one of the 14 points of profound knowledge is tear down motivational posters. Did anybody read that? It's just, what? Tear down motivational posters. But when you understand the intent behind it, what he's saying is, if you have motivational posters, you assume that the problem is your people, and the problem is not your people, it's your system. Over 90% of the problems that you have in your organization are based on the design of your system and not the people that are operating in the system. So you put up a motivational poster, you're assuming that Don's not motivated, so I gotta get him motivated. So, I mean, Deming is brilliant. and and. And, and this quote here is just, it's just perfect. A system has to be managed. You cannot have a system that goes unmanaged. It will not manage itself and left to itself in the Western world, components will become selfish, competitive, independent, profit centers, and thus destroy the system, and thus destroy the company. If you don't manage the system, the system will destroy your company. The secret is cooperation between components towards the aim of the organization. We cannot afford the destructive effects of competition. And this is not competition of like GM versus IBM. This is internal competition that we create inside of our organizations that actually destroy our organizations because we don't know how to cooperate. We don't understand the effects that it has. We don't understand the things that we put in place with inside of our organizations that force us into these Nash equilibrium kinds of situations. So we're gonna kind of drill down a little bit further into that. Anyway, I just had to throw this Deming quote in here because it's absolutely perfect. Um, the first step, hi. Hey, have you, you, you've been over there across the way, haven't you? 
were you working down? No. Nope, no? No, I've been here a lot. I've been back and forth, yeah. Okay, but you were not working in the office down there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm Tom. Me too. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Uh, should I start over again? <laughs> yes, or Healy, please. <laughs> Ooh, good one. Or interpretive dance, that'd be fun. Interpretive dance. I, Tom and interpretive dance. This is good. Gosh. There's something. Okay. Tom and Patrick. Yeah. Rule number one in the system of profound knowledge, it, Deming says, is an appreciation of the system. And you need to recognize that you work and you live in a system, and our systems are everywhere. And the simple definition of a system is you got input, some process, and there's some output as a result of that. And you need to look at what it is that you're working in and have an appreciation that it's a system. So one of the great definitions of a system comes from Donella Meadows in her book, Thinking in Systems. She says, system is an interconnected set of elements that coherently organize in a way to achieve something. We have some desired output, and we have things that are supposedly working well together in order for us to be able to get that. So here we go. We got input, goes into a system, and we got output. Now, what we learned 100 years ago, and we haven't seemed to unlearn that, is this concept called reductionism. And the idea of reductionism is you basically take your system, break it into a space of components, and then you take each one of those steps in the component and you optimize each one of those steps independently of one another. And then supposedly when you bring them all back together after locally optimizing all these things, somehow our output is supposed to increase, but we have learned over time that our output actually decreases. Why does that happen? So reductionism actually kind of worked well with Henry Ford's assembly lines. You got all these stations that you got on your assembly line, and you locally optimize each one of them. But when we try to apply this kind of reductionism within software development, we see that it actually breaks the system down and things get worse as a result of doing a reductionism. So what we need to do is we need to look at things a little bit differently. Dr. Acoff was a, um, uh, a protege of, of Deming, and he has this great quote here, the system is a product of the interactions of the parts. It's not the individual parts being locally optimized, it's the interaction between the parts. And so this is what he's saying. He says, focus on the interactions. Focus on the cooperation between the parts within side of a system. Now, why does Agile work so well? This is why Agile is such an incredibly good thing. Think of this as just as a high level value stream. If somebody has an idea and it makes it into production and it goes through, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but look at what Agile actually does. Agile says, let's focus on the interactions between the two, and here's how we do that. Now, back in the old days, remember I told you I've been in software for 26 years, 13 years in Waterfall. Back in the old days, we would have requirements documentation that somebody would come up with, throw it over the wall, and give it to developers. Where's the interaction there? It's not a very good bit of interaction. It's better than nothing, but it's not very good. Between, the interaction between dev and QA was test plans. I actually worked for a company where QA was in a building three blocks away behind locked doors, and they didn't give the phone number of the people in QA to the developers. They deliberately kept them separate, and the only way that they could interact was through tools and not conversations. And then what do we do? We end up delivering release notes to operations so that they can put the thing out there. And you see that the interaction between these steps in the workflow is document-oriented. It's not the kinds of things that we value inside of Agile. Well, what does Agile do? Agile says that the product owner should be on your team. They are a first class member of the team. They're actually communicating on a daily basis. And one of our Agile principles is business people and developers must work together on a daily basis. Every day you're talking with one another. We're focused on that interaction and optimizing the interaction. What do we do with uh, the interaction between Dev and QA? QA are a first class member of the team. They sit next to developers. They have conversations with developers. If a QA person finds a defect, they don't log the bug, they just nudge the developer and say, look at that, fix it. Ten minutes later, it's fixed. We don't have all of that fanfare associated with trying to track defects and, and so on. So we've made them a first-class member of the team. The most effective method of conveying information is face-to-face -face conversation. So we put these people on the same team. Oh, no, do I have to start all over again? <laughs> no, no. Oh, no. <clears throat> Skip the dance. Okay, we did Swahili and a dance, but uh, we're not going to. All right, and then what do we do here? Between the development effort and the operations effort, if you haven't read the Phoenix Project, you should read the Phoenix Project. And it talks about how to get dev and ops working together again, working close side by side with one another. It's a collaborative working relationship between dev and operations. So what are we doing? We're focusing on that interaction between the parts. 
We're not trying to locally optimize the parts. We're focused on the interaction between the parts. Key word here again is the word cooperation. We're cooperating. We're not competing against one another. So we're going to spend a few minutes talking about constraints. And if you've seen the beer game, I talk about constraints a little bit. And, and I'm a huge fan of something called uh, the theory of constraints by Ellie Goldratt. And again, it's, it's more systems thinking stuff uh, from another luminary, Ellie Goldratt. And he came up with this concept called the theory of constraints. And so what he basically says is when you've got a system like this and you want to increase the amount of throughput in your system, what do you need to do? Well, th there's something in your system that is a constraint. Every system has a constraint. And it's the constraint that reduces the amount of throughput that goes through your system. So what you want to do is you want to find the constraint, focus on it, and break that if you want to be able to increase the throughput. If you focus anywhere else in your system to try to locally optimize that thing in your system, what's the end result? You haven't generated any more throughput in your system by locally optimizing somewhere else that isn't your constraint. So with Ellie Goldratt, it's all about the constraint and working with the constraint and, and trying to break the constraint. And then once you break it, it's gonna, a new constraint is going to show up in your system and you find that and you break it and it becomes a cycle that you go through. So again, this is another tool that we have in systems thinking that we're going to talk a little bit more about. And, and, and this is the way that um, Goldratt talks about how you break a constraint. The first thing you have to do is you have to know where the constraint is in your system. You have to identify the constraint. The second thing is you have to exploit the constraint. Now, when he talks about exploiting the constraint, basically what he's saying is it's the constraint that determines how much throughput there is in the system, and therefore you should keep the constraint 100% busy. Don't let the constraint become idle. That's what he means by exploiting. It's a different way that most people think about the word exploit, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the idea is find your constraint and keep it 100% busy. Now, it's step number three. Step number three has been the bane of my existence for about five years now. As I've understood theory of constraints, I cannot get people to understand step number three, subordinate to the constraint. That basically means you have to slow your system down on anything else that isn't your constraint. Keep your constraint 100% busy and keep everything else less than 100% busy. Remember Brooks Law? When we talk about putting more people on a project and me as a project manager for 13 years, I was just worried about everything except for the constraint. So getting people to understand, to subordinate, is, is a tough challenge. And that's the purpose of this talk, is to try to get people to recognize that you need to subordinate to the constraint. And you're always going to feel compelled to not do that. So how do I convince you to not do that? So we're going to talk quite a bit more about that, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, the fourth step is elevate. And with elevate the constraint, it basically means if you've done everything else, like exploiting and subordinating, you still haven't broken your constraints, sometimes you just need to go out and buy more. You need to put another person on the team, or you need to get a faster server. You need to invest money into it to be able to elevate the constraint through some kind of an external means. So it usually involves spending money to, to get more stuff in. Uh, and then after you've successfully done this and you've broken your constraint, what you got to do is you got to recognize you got a new constraint in your system and you have to go find that and then you go back through this process of identifying, exploit, subordinate. If, if you break your constraint after subordinating, you don't even have to elevate. You just keep trying these things until you hit the right thing and then it happens again. You should come to the beer game. The next time I do the beer game, you should attend that. Um, we'll talk more about that, and uh, hopefully some ideas will materialize out of this. Uh, but the beer game, that's the whole point of the beer game, is to show how to use these five focusing steps in, it's, it's, do you do Agile? Do you do, you know, Kanban? I'll show you a picture. Well, it'll come up here in a little bit. Another simple one is we had a print speed issue, and it actually was a limitation, it turned out it was a limitation of the device. It was not that we weren't speeding the reference too fast enough. It was it couldn't keep speed through with the microprinter because the ink wouldn't bind. Well, that's, that's a great physical example of a system that generates output that you found the constraint. It wasn't CPU, it was a, a feeder of some sort. And we printed faster, and the materials check didn't bounce back because they didn't have the right adhesion. So the constraint was the check had to be passable, so it didn't matter how fast we printed them. If they weren't passable, it, it, it failed. Yeah. So one example, I think, is you have the five developers and two QA, and the developers are done in code, and they know what it is. He's attended the beer game. Have you been to the beer game? 
That's, that's, that's really close to the actual scenario that we've got. Uh, let, let's play with that one a little bit more. Go ahead and finish your thought on that. And at that point, so the developer keeps turning the code and the kids say, oh my God, I'm falling behind. And the work starts piling up. At that most point, you get rid of the couple of developers to whatever the work, the flow continues. That, that's absolutely perfect. So in your scenario, where's the constraint? Is it developers? QA. It's QA. Yeah. And what did you do to alleviate that problem? I did subordinate. You subordinated. You had less stuff going into QA. Now, there's a tremendous amount of advantage to that. QA doesn't get overburdened. QA doesn't get burned out. QA doesn't have to kind of skimp to get everything done. And so the quality of the software is going to go up as a result. And when your quality goes up, there's less rework. So your system actually goes faster by having less developers. It's a perfect example. That's really close to what the beer game is all about. Um, another example, though, is if, if you didn't subordinate, you didn't take those two developers off, and you had budget, where would you hire another person? Q. You would hire another QA, because that's where your constraint is. Your constraint is QA. Now, me, back in the old days when I was a waterfall project manager, I had no clue about this stuff. If my project was running late, and I had your scenario, do you know what I would do? I would hire another developer, because it's all about developers, right? It's all about writing code. I didn't understand the system. so. This, this is what I used to do. This is what I used to do back in my days, my waterfall days, the days before I was enlightened. So I, I pick on myself because I can't, I can't say, you know, people nowadays, this is what they do. I got to pick on myself because it's kind of unfair for me to. I thought that was what you wanted to do with me today, was pick on me. No. Okay. No, I'm done with you. Are you done with I should move down. <laughs> I'm done with you, Don. Um, yeah, how can I be angry and upset with people for making the mistakes that I used to make? Okay, so I gotta be a little lighter on these folks and not call them knuckleheads. But so instead of me doing the five focusing steps, this is what I would do. I would go right to number two and I would exploit. But I would exploit everybody. And what do I mean by exploiting everybody? Everybody's gonna work weekends. Our project is running late. We need to increase throughput. What am I gonna do? I'm going to exploit, and I'm not exploiting the constraint, I'm exploiting everybody. Everybody's going to work the weekends, and of course I would show up too. I wouldn't do anything to help increase the throughput, but at least I was exploiting myself as well as QA and devs. The whole team was there for the weekend. So that's the first thing I would always do, exploit. Everybody work weekends. The second thing that I would do, if that wasn't sufficient, is I would elevate. Now elevate is buy more, right? But what I do, I would get more people working on the project, but because Notice I haven't identified the constraint yet. Or am I going to put these new people that I'm putting on the project, I'm going to make them developers instead of QA. The other problem with that is, remember what we said about exploiting the constraint. You want to keep them 100% busy. The other half of that is make sure that you keep them 100% doing the things that they can do that nobody else can do. So if I hire more developers onto this project, and my best developers are my constraint, who's going to train the new people on the team? It's my best people. So my best people are going to be training rather than writing code, so I'm no longer exploiting my, my constraint. So at this point when I elevate, I'm violating Brooks' law. Why am I violating Brooks' law? Because I'm not addressing the constraint in the system. So after I bring more people on the project and we're still running late, then I go to step number one. I go to identify. But I'm not identifying the constraint. I'm just looking for somebody to blame. At this point, the project is late. I'm hosed. I'm going to go out and I'm going to identify the likely culprit to blame on the project. Okay, this is, this is, we know this happens. I did it. I'm admitting to it. Okay, I'm a little bit better now. Okay, and then step number four, we repeat. But in this case, we don't repeat and go out and break the new constraint. We just go out and make the same mistake over and over again. So we do the same thing over and over again. Now, in my old way of doing things, do you notice that something's missing? What's missing? Out of the five focusing steps, which one of the steps is missing? Yeah. Subordinate, it's not there. I never knew about subordinating the constraint. I didn't know the value of it. Even today, when I know the value of it, I still feel compelled, so drawn into it, that I have to continue to remind myself, don't do that. Find the constraint and breaking the constraint. By the way, um, it's, it's kind of a, a trick question here. I say, what's missing? There's actually two things missing here. 
How many of you read Ellie Goldratt's The Goal? Nobody's read Ellie Goldratt's The Goal, but you've seen A Beautiful Mind. Do you guys watch too much TV and don't read enough books? <laughs> <clears throat> this is known as the five focusing steps of the theory of constraints, but there's really seven steps. Okay, everybody knows about step zero, and it's even in the title of his book. The title of his book is called The Goal. Step number one, you have to identify the goal of your system. And if you don't know what the goal of your system is, how are, you going to how are you going to optimize that system to generate more throughput? Because it's your goal that defines what is your throughput. And if you don't know what the goal of your system is, it's kind of a waste of time. So do we know what the goal of the system is here? Um, so subordinate is one of the things that's missing. The other thing that's missing is identify the goal, which is actually step zero. It assumes that you know what the goal of your system is. Uh, I will leave step six, which is the seventh step of the five focusing steps, for a whole nother talk. If you like this one, I'll come back with that one in the summer. I will be back in the summer to do that talk. Um, Is he going to melt in the rain? Uh, well, he's, Michael's saying that he has a hard time finding speakers in the summer, and he gets plenty of speakers in November. He's, he's got a glut of speakers this month. So um, I promised him that I would come back in the summer, and maybe that's when I'll do it. Okay, so... Again, thinking, we're talking about looking at the system, we're talking about optimizing the system, we're talking about understanding the system, and in, in particular, looking at step number three, which is subordinate to the constraint, and then going back to the prisoner's dilemma, supporting the constraint, cooperation. Supporting the constraint, cooperation. Yes? Um, so if I subordinate, how does that make me faster? Because I, I, since I'm slower by the slow process, I haven't changed the process. And also, since you wanted to put more people on the subordinate process, then you're violating Burke's law. So, so I'm confused. Or do you want us to read the there, there's, Well, there, there's, there's more detail in here, but I'm afraid we're not going to get to it. Okay, fine. Okay. Here, here's the simplest of all scenarios. What time did you go to work this morning? I didn't. <laughs> Eight o'clock. Okay, okay, I'll talk Who about got on the freeway this morning to get to work? Was there a metering light on your on-ramp? Yes. What does the metering light do? It forces you to slow down, yes. subordinate you. What does it do to the overall system? It allows the flow of traffic to be a whole lot more steady. That's, that's the simplest of examples of subordinating to the constraint. Don't let inventory build up. Don't let things start queuing up. Don't just keep things at a nice, <laughs> steady, there's a great word, lean. Keep things as lean as possible. The leaner you keep it, the faster things go through your system and things don't start queuing up. I understand the don't queuing up part, but you have not made the system go faster. You actually, You're generating more throughput. You actually have slower delay. If I'm, 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 running, if I'm running my, pro, my subordinate process, 100% capacity all the time. The problem is when you're running at 100% right now, you think you're 100%, but because of all the inventory, I as a QA need to focus on that one story that I may not have worked on, and I'm actually running 85%. So the 100% efficiency run that you think of right now is actually an illusion. Plus, well, now you are piling on more code in the code base that's generating all those stories, which I won't ever get to QA anyway, and now it's slowing me down. Then it's, it's it's like a it's like a downward spiral. Then it will slow you down as a, as a result. If you look at the overall system, it comes to a grinding halt. Um, let me give that quite working for it. We'll move on. Yeah, let me give you another example though, because this is a good example because it's another one of the things that I used to do. Um, I used to use Microsoft Project, and as a project manager, I would plan out everything that we we're going to be doing in the next three months, sure. and I was good for about two days. <laughs> <laughs> and then the plan would just start to crumble and then next week I would come out with the next plan and it was good for about two days but here's what I would do Here, here's why it didn't work I would assign people to tasks and I would have durations on the tasks and there was this lovely little button in Microsoft Project that says resource level and I would resource level everything and, and, and this is weird I never felt bad about resource leveling and leaving somebody at 150% utilization. 
but I always felt bad if I left somebody at 75% utilization. I was a bad project manager because I didn't fully utilize somebody inside my project. And I never felt bad about making my developers work 150% on some of the tasks. What happens when you have things that are not your constraint, that you have 100% resource utilized? What happens when something unexpected happens? Something you didn't plan for. A bug shows up. You have to spend time working on something that wasn't in your plan to begin with. And let's say that, oh man, I have to start over again. Let's, and I got an example in here, but I don't think we're going to get to it. But let me, let me see if this helps you feel a little bit better. Let's say you got one guy, his name is Brent, and he is the constraint in your system. He's your super programmer, and he is just your rock star. And Brent does back-end stuff. And he's got somebody that has to do some front-end development for him in order for him to finish his task. And so there's a dependency that's been created there. Brent can't start his back end until somebody does the front end stuff. And so you 100% resource utilize the front end person, but they're not the constraint. Brent is the constraint. Something comes up. The person gets sick for a day. Another task shows up. And that dependency on this person to get something done in order for Brent to get done, now because there's no slack or no buffer inside of the project, You've eaten up any opportunity to be able to deliver to Brent on time, and now Brent is waiting. Remember, exploit your constraint. Make sure he's never waiting for work to be done. The only way that you can ensure that he doesn't get things, he doesn't end up waiting for things, is you have to build buffer, feeding buffers into your project plan to make sure that you never leave Brent waiting for work. Things are going to happen. Things are always going to change, and you need to have enough buffer inside of your system to be able to accommodate for the kinds of changes that happen with inside of projects. Now that's kind of an old scenario, Gantt chart kind of a scenario, but it does, I think, a pretty good job of trying to discover, describe what that is. And there's some slides in here that kind of talk to that too. But uh, uh, hopefully, I, you're I really like the freeway analogy. Actually, you like that better than yeah, my my brain. The reason I like it is if you think of a freeway that's fixed, it's got six lanes or whatever, not many of them have four lanes, but it's got four lanes, right? It has a certain capacity. It can only move so many cars at a certain speed. No matter what you do, it's only going to move so many cars at a certain speed. So if those metering lights are turned off and they let everybody plow on the freeway as fast as they can, what's going to happen is that freeway is going to become congested and its throughput will reduce. Fewer cars will move down the freeway in, the, in, a, in time T than they would if you actually stop some of those cars from getting on the freeway. And you probably see that every day when you get on the freeway. Right? I, I get on with a metering light and on the next time I get on the freeway. And sometimes the lights are on and sometimes they're not because I'm a reverse commuter, right? But when they're, when they're on, I get mad because I have to stop. But then as soon as I get to go, I get to go. Whereas if I, if I didn't have to stop, I probably wouldn't have been able to go. And for miles, I would have been frustrated about that as opposed to being frustrated because I had to wait for four cars to, to you know, go through the light cycle and the dirt that goes in the carpool lane. I don't know if I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think but I think if you think of that freeway like that, so the other alternative you have, of course, is let's just put another lane in the freeway, right? But that's expensive, and that's like people, right? That's like adding another person to your project. And it'll slow down throughput for a certain period of time. Yeah, the yeah, they'd have to do construction, right? <laughs> and the construction is analogous to planning, exactly. right? Exactly. From the planning system, I was thinking, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I don't know if that if that works for you, but it really works well for me because. When there's too many cars on the road, nobody's moving. I understand the analogy. Right. The problem is it's an analogy. Um, so I have a problem with um, Anyway, it's cool. All, all, all models are wrong. Some are useful. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that yeah, uh, quote from, before, from yeah. George Box. It's, it's a brilliant one. Yeah. Um, there, there's other literature. There's other things. The beer game talks about that. There's, there's, I got a little bit of a bibliography at the end of this. And one of them, one of the books on there is called This is Lean. And it talks about small batch sizes and reducing cycle time and how that makes the systems much more efficient and, and maybe that's something that we need to follow up on and that's the kind of feedback that I'm looking for when this thing's all done. So anyway, let, let's go back to this. Let's go back to our prisoner's dilemma. I have a, a good example of this. Um, this is like intelligent um, network routing. It's also like throttling. So it's controlling the speed of the network. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you work for Cisco? 
I used to. Oh, okay. <laughs> How could you tell? <laughs> All right, so we're going to come back to the same prisoner's dilemma. We're going to call this one the project manager's dilemma this time. And we're going to essentially play the same kind of a game where I've got a project to get done, and Don's got a project to get done. And if Don and I cooperate, we'll both get done in two years. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to put your systems thinking hat on here and, and study the system and analyze the system and think through the system. So we're going to do a first pass at it to try to draw a parallel between this and the prisoner's dilemma, but then I want you to be a little bit more critical about this. Um, let's, let's change it instead of confessing and denying. Let's use terms like locally optimize and globally optimize. What if Don and I both look to globally optimize the work that we're going to do. We're going to cooperate. Remember that we talked about in a system, it's the interaction between the systems, and Don and I are going to talk, and we're going to cooperate, and we're going to get his project done in two years and my project done in two years. But I could be a real jerk. <laughs> and I can decide to say, Don, tough. I'm going to do what's best for me, and I'm going to get my project done in a year, and I'm going to be a hero. And what's going to happen to Don, because I'm not cooperating with Don, he's going, to get, uh, he's going to get less budget, he's going to get not the cream of the crop developers, he's not going to get the time and attention of people in order for him to get his stuff done, so he's going to suffer from me locally optimizing and you globally optimizing, trying to do the right thing, and so it's going to take you 10 years to do your project. But you're not going to put up with that, because you're bonus is dependent on you getting this project done in, in not 10 years. So what are you compelled to do? Locally optimize. You're compelled to locally optimize and now what we've got is we've got you and me competing against one another instead of cooperating with one another. And what happens? It ends up taking us to the Nash equilibrium. The Nash equilibrium. It's going to take us longer to get things done because we're just not cooperating. So that's the first blush. And when I put this together, I said, yeah, that's pretty good. I'm done with that slide. And then I looked at it. And David Vidra, he's not here. He's presented here before. Actually, 45 got 15 minutes. minutes I got 15 minutes. OK, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing, I'm doing really good. David, is, is, he's, he's a Russian guy. He still has a bit of an accent. And, and I just imagine David sitting here and I, I knew exactly what David was going to say when I got to this point. <laughs> so the analogy here is a pretty weak analogy because there's, there's another level that we need to put into this Nash equilibrium. And does anybody see what else that we need to consider here in this, in this specific example that kind of makes this point not as, as relevant when it comes to software? Well, there, there's an assumption baked in here. Is it when things happen? No. No. There's an assumption baked in here that Don's project is equally as valuable as my project. What if Don's project is more valuable than my project? Shouldn't we locally optimize for his project? Now let's, let's just throw numbers out just for the fun of it. Let's say that Don's project is going to generate $10 million of revenue for GE Digital. We, we all work at GE Digital, Don and I, and we're GE. You missed the introduction. You missed the intro. I work for GE Digital. He's going to make $10 million for GE, and I'm going to make 100000 Should we locally, should we globally optimize for what's best for both of us? It's got to be him. Okay, so put your systems thinking hat back on. What's step zero of the five focusing steps? What's the goal? What's the goal of our system? To generate revenue for GE. And if I can locally optimize and get him to generate $10 million in one year rather than two years, so I can make my measly $100,000 in two years instead of 10 years, we should locally optimize for you. Yeah, it's not that simple, but we need to, we need to start getting our hands wrapped around these concepts of we need to think of systems we need to understand the nature of systems. We need to understand how these systems behave so we can make intelligent choices when we start doing this kind of stuff. If, 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 I'll be right there. Okay. If I were Don's boss, if, no, wait, 
you, you got the good project. You got the $10 million project, and I got the $10,000 or the $100,000 project. That's because you're not a nice guy, and they know that. <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't I be convinced to be a nice guy? But no, I'm not. I'm incented to not be a nice guy because my bonus is dependent on me getting this project done in two or maybe three years, so I'm not going to cooperate. We put these processes in place into our organizations to incent people to locally optimize at the wrong time for the wrong things or because we don't take the time to prioritize what are the most important things that we should be working on because we don't understand the goal of the system and how our decisions impact the goal of the system, we end up making bad decisions. We end up going all the way back to that slide that we had at the very beginning. That was the one from uh, the, the, the quote from Deming, which I think was slide number seven. Whoops. Where is that Deming quote? I'm sorry, I should, there, there we go. The system must be managed. Somebody must manage the system. Somebody needs to be outside of the system, looking at the system and seeing what's happening with inside the system. I, I cannot manage the system that I'm inside of because you know what I'm gonna do? Doggone it, I'm gonna locally optimize that system because I'm incented to do that. I need to be completely independent of the system, look at it from the outside and manage it from the outside, not being a part of it. This is why scrum masters are so important. A scrum master cannot be a developer on the team and a scrum master because they're going to focus on writing their code and they're not going to stop and look and how's the overall system working? Do we need to, do I need to slow down? We need to have somebody like a scrum master that takes themselves out of the system and looks at the system. Do you still have a point you want to make? Well, there's two questions. I have two questions. I have one that's right on the um, And I have two. What have been the, the macroeconomics is one of the examples in where they had uh, um, a lawyer just say they make seventy dollars an hour. This is back when I read the economics book. So seventy dollars an hour, and they had a secretary. The the lawyer can type a hundred words a minute, and the secretary can type it's a bad secretary only ten words a minute. Yeah. So should I have the lawyer type the, the letter, or should I have the secretary type the letter? Um, and that's with the marginal cost and all this kind of other good stuff. Yeah. And the, I believe the answer was, of course, is to have the secretary type the letter anyway, um, <laughs> because you're, um, even though it took them longer to you know to type it out. So there's, there's other factors, economic principles involved in just besides yeah. that. And then the other question I have about that is how, as a Uber manager, do you keep you incentivized because you give your, your bonus is based upon your, your performance too? Ouch, you know, um, you know that's an interesting problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if you incent the group based on the performance of the group rather than the individuals based on the mm -hmm. performance of the individuals, you can try to approach it I understand that that's easier said than done. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. But, but if you can try to approach it from that point of view, then you're incenting the system to perform well rather than incenting the individual. Yeah, I might have a story where basically someone gave a homework to a class, okay. and basically the, the, the smart person in the class finished the homework in 10 minutes, and he, he sat there um, and waited and helped everybody else finish the homework mm -hmm. before anybody left the classroom. Mm -hmm. That's a group incentive. That's, that was the culture of that mm -hmm. it's it's a culture of cooperation yeah, absolutely you, yeah I don't have to see it unless everybody see every, leave no person behind I guess is basically what we're doing here yeah um, it's a different different approach yeah we, we can't have bad people then <laughs> well sure you can because I mean what do you mean by a bad people right we basically just someone's gonna sit around going I'm, I'm enjoying my yeah life. but you can't have those in any that's, yeah well if you, if you locally optimize they're gone <laughs> right it doesn't matter whether you locally or locally optimize <laughs> okay it's a good point Right. But the benefit, though, if we get the $10 million, then the project funding is going to be better because there's more revenue and therefore there's more project money. So next year, hopefully, you're, there would be enough money for your project. Might so easily $100,000 project. But, but you're right. The ROI there, there's a word in here. It's called trust. Yeah. Right. And that, and you have to get to a point where you can do that with the people that you work with. So yeah. It's going to go. And, and that's complicated. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so this is going right where I wanted it to go. Well, thank you. I'm very glad I get some. <laughs> Which is, I had, no, I, I had no idea where it was going to go. And that's the point that there's a lot of systems thinking things that we're kind of putting on the table here, thinking of Deming and appreciation for systems and cooperation and subordinating to the constraint. And we're kind of laying the groundwork for, okay, how are we going to apply this? How does it affect things? Where do we look at this stuff? This is, this is not a one-hour talk. This can go off in at least three different directions. How are we going to apply these concepts at the team level? at the individual level and the team level? How can we apply this at the value stream level? 
how do we apply this at the enterprise level? Because you're bringing up enterprisey kinds of things and we need to learn how to apply these system thinking processes in all of these different areas. So th this, this, is, this is where I want to get to. You know, where does this talk go from here? Where do I take this talk? So what's, what's the primary theme, the thread that you're getting out of this? I got to be honest. When I put together a talk like this, let me let me show you what the these these are all of the different slides that I got on the talk, and 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 I I, I just throw a bunch of crap on the wall, and I want to see what sticks. But what sticks with me is different than what sticks with you guys. I mean, I love systems thinking stuff, but is it is it helping you? Are we getting to a place with this talk where? Now that we have thinking skills, where do you want to begin to apply this? So what's the good? So my daughter said the exact same thing. What, what's my want? She's studying theater, she's studying acting, and, and the methodology that she's learning says, define what your want is. What is my want? Well, my want is for people to recognize how hard it is to subordinate to the constraint. This goes all the way to, you know, uh, Brooks Law and why we're so compelled to put people on projects and we don't ever subordinate. Why is it so hard? Well, I'm trying to explain why it's so hard because we're incented not to do it. All the systems that we put in place are incent us to locally optimize, which destabilizes the system. And then sometimes we need to locally optimize because he's got a $10 million project and I got a measly 10. We just don't apply systems thinking to analyze this, and how do we begin to apply these systems thinking things? Um, yeah, that, that's that's a great example of one direction that we can go in. But let me, let me back up a little bit and then we're going to come back to your, your suggestion here. What do you see as the theme, the thread that's going through all this stuff? In my head, I think there's a theme and a thread. And I've used the same word over and over again, or a couple of words over and over again, trying to get my point across of what I think is the theme here. But what are you, what are you seeing? What are you, what's, what's resonating with you guys that helps me make that thread go through this presentation a little bit more cleanly the next time I do this. Is there a single word that kind of jumps out? Because I've, I've repeated a couple of words. Do, do, you, do, you, do you feel like it's more the cooperation? Is that the thread? Is that the thing that we need to talk about more? Building a culture of cooperation. I got another. That's a word like Greenwashing that from anything you just read into green. So I think if I hear someone speak, that's number three, subordination. Yeah. That is the key stuff, something actionable. Cooperation, everybody wants to cooperate. Even the guy who is the, who is the toughest guy in the crowd, he thinks he's cooperating. Well, that, that's the key. They yeah. think they're cooperating, but then you look at the processes that they put in place and it sends you to not cooperate. Um, you know, we work at GE. Jack Welsh was the guy that invented stack ranking. Yeah. You know, he'd have your managers rank the top 10, you know, people, and if you're in the bottom 10%, you're fired. That's a good example of... Uh, and, and so am I incented to help Rajiv that one, Rajiv's a little slow. I'm not incented because that will put me further down on the list because my productivity isn't as... I was, I was there at Microsoft the day that Microsoft announced that they were stopping stack ranking. And it was just fascinating to watch how people responded. I was there as a, as a consultant, so I wasn't an employee, so it didn't have any impact on me. People were not happy. You would think people would be running through the halls, hoo-hoo! The most unhappy people were the people that were ranked number one continually. They were really unhappy. Yeah. Are you forced to work with the other words? It's a, it's a percept the instant perception. Yeah, so, 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 so there's this whole subordinate to the constraint, but it's cooperation. Now, I, I can't separate the two. 
And I don't know if I should separate the two between subordinate to the constraint and cooperation. So that's why I'm looking for your, your input. Well, I, if you break your system of components and you locally ma a minim maximize or minimize each component, you don't necessarily maximize the total system. And you want to break it into two parts, which is not violating what you said at the beginning. What are those two parts? Um, um, what you just said. Oh, my, my, my talk. Splitting it up into cooperation as well as yeah. So you want to you want to locally minimum uh, locally optimize each section, but you're not op optimizing the whole system. You want to optimize the whole system. If you had a choice between me talking about only subordinating the constraint or only talking about cooperation, which one resonates with you more? Uh, the first one, the second one is just people thing. People. People thing. That's people you could talk to that for for for, for millennia. Still a lot of yeah. to work out. Yeah. Because people have egos and all that kind of stuff. And it's just, just it's this can of worms to me. Um, yeah. how, how do you deal with that? You know, I mean, you get three people in a room, you get 17 opinions. And, and I think there's answers to how to optimize that. Yeah. But it's, it's well, complicated. Yes. Uh, there's ways to do it, sure. <coughs> <laughs> uh, and I would probably take the opposite side too, and then just say that I think the other is more bi not binary exactly, but it's more black and white. And so I think the other is harder to achieve and there are, there are more, it is, the tools are not as obvious. You know, if, you t if you're someone who reads a lot, cooperation is not a topic that is overt and, and on the surface uh, in many books. And so they, I think that that, for me at least, would be something where it's like, all right, well teach me something new, add some tools to my belt that might work because I, I use the ones I got, but they don't always work. Oh. So I, 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 it's not the right wrong thing, but I'm yeah, I said yeah, that makes perfect. Yes, it depends on your role. Yes. All right, so it's it's seven thirty. Should we be wrapping up here pretty soon? Yeah. Can I yeah. have one more comment? Maybe. I don't know. Think it what, 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 does, does the group want you to yeah. speak? Should we, we support it to his 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 vote? <laughs> we cooperate with him. So, <laughs> so you know, it's funny because because so as Tom has said twenty five times, we work together, the three of us. And David, who, by the way, threw in his plug, is speaking in November or something or other about it. 17th about Jenkins and Docker containers and stuff. So, um, And we've talked, I've seen the Bear Game talk, of course, and we've talked numerous times on various occasions with many of us about this topic. And the thing that's popping out in my head tonight that is different than something that's popped out before is the whole thing about it, when you talked about uh, Demden and taking down the motivational posters. And, and I think that if I look at how um, GE works, to be honest, and pretty much any other company that I work at, there's a huge amount of focus on dealing with the people and figuring out how to make them perform better. A huge amount. Yeah. And we spend <coughs> much less time and much less effort looking at how we work and what the system is that we work in. And I don't know, I, I don't know whether that exactly helps you or not, but it's just something that as I look at it and I think about, you know, we don't stack rank at GE, but at least not formally, you know, people probably do anyway. But when I look at the team of people that I work with, are, are some smarter than others? Yeah, okay. Are some, do some write more lines of code than others? Yeah. Does some of them who write more lines of code have more quality problems? Yeah. Right, so it's not simple. It's a very complicated problem. But I think we spend a lot of time looking at these people and saying, you know, you're a good person and you're a good person, you're a bad person and you're a bad person and you're, and we don't focus on, I, I, and this is, you know, I, I may be way too old to be this naive, but I believe in people. And generally speaking, I think most people have good intentions and they have good goals, but we spend a lot of time worried about that. You know, there, there's so many great stories that we could tell about the Numi plant in Fremont. I don't know if you know the story of the Numi plant in Fremont. It was, uh, it, at one time it was a GE plant, or a, a GM plant, sorry, and it was one of the worst, and they shut it down because it was so bad. And then when Toyota decided that they were going to cooperate with GM and put a plant and they created the Numi plant there, somebody had the, the, the vision to say, you know what, I'm not going to hire a fresh bunch of people here. I'm going to take the deadbeats that we had before, the drug addicts, the people that were perpetually late to work, that perpetually weren't showing up for work. I'm going to take those people and I'm going to put them in the NUMI. And we're going to get a different management structure, a Toyota-style management structure. And it turned out to be the best plant that GM had. 
GM then tried to replicate that from plant to plant and they missed what it was. It's cargo coal kinds of stuff. But the point here was the same people that behaved so poorly are now behaving so phenomenally well. And what's the point? It's the system. And so I guess the, the, the meta thing here is I'm trying to teach systems thinking and I didn't really intend to bring up the motivational poster thing, but maybe I should. Why do we want to care about systems thinking? Because the problem is not people. The problem is the systems that we put around it. Did it have been like a group? Um, did a group speak? Are you familiar? No. Oh, it's the same group. Well, same, maybe we can do it. It's, um, it's a process yeah. where the group of people were sorting out the groups. Yeah, OK. And they keep giving the people incentive, like vacation. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, money, money, I have money. to look into that. I yeah, had no yeah, idea. So there. The, the beer game talk is based on the beer game in at MIT, which is in Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline. So I, I love these, these kinds of things. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up by showing you one last slide. I love books. I love reading. I used to have time to read a lot when I took the train. Now I'm driving to, to work every day. But, you know, the, let, me, let me back up here for a second. Question number two, how do you globally optimize at the team level at the value stream level or at the enterprise level. We could spend time talking about any one of those. Uh, if you're interested in any of those, if you want to learn how to optimize at the team level, it's the two books on the left. Extreme programming is brilliant. There's, there's a new kind of programming uh, paradigm called mob programming. If you haven't studied or read about mob programming, it's pretty cool. Um, Alistair Coburn talks about software development as a cooperative game. So if you like that stuff that we were talking about, about software and games and, and how to approach software development as a cooperative game, his book talks all about that. If you're interested in value stream, this, the book, This is Lean, is absolutely brilliant. Uh, there's a talk on, there call, uh, on video that you can find called Red Brick Cancer. And I would suggest that you watch the first 15 minutes of a video called Red Brick Cancer. The guy who wrote this book, This Is Lean, has got that video. And in that video, it's an example of how to optimize a system. The beauty of this is our medical systems are optimized for the wrong thing. In our medical systems, the unit of value is the doctor. If you go to this book and read about what they did in Denmark or wherever it was, the unit of value was the patient, and so they optimized the whole process around what the true value was. Here, it's not the patient that we value, it's the doctor, so we optimize systems for the doctor, which has a terrible workflow process. Anyway, This is Lean is brilliant. Uh, Stanley McChrystal's book, Team of Teams, it's brilliant if you want to understand how to apply this stuff at the enterprise level. How do you create something more than just a scrum of scrums? How do you have an organization that is structured for complete global optimization of the system while continuing to maintain a hierarchical kind of format like you have in the military? It's absolutely brilliant. And then, of course, Ellie Gold wrote book, The Goal, and then the follow-up that he did called Critical Chain, if you like that kind of stuff. Um, the slide deck is going to be available to you guys. I'll make sure that Mike gets this so you don't have to write notes if you want to just get the books off of here. Um, there, there's a bunch of other stuff in here. You know, it's, it's all the stuff that I threw on the wall that I didn't. Oh, that's the beer game. I told you I'd show you a picture of the beer. Who did I tell this to? That's the beer game presentation. Anyway, so there's a bunch of stuff in here that we didn't get to and we're not going to get to. And, and if you want to hear the beer game, then just invite me back and make sure there's beer. <laughs> All right, Mike. Sounds great. Thank you very much.